your talk actually set a perfect scenario for the following talk, which will be given by Professor Zobay Yunossi, who is Chairman and Professor of Medicine at the Innova Fairfax Medical Campus in Virginia. Professor Yunossi is a very uh, acknowledged authority in the field of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and non-alcoholic steatosis, and will certainly give us an idea of a very confusing field at the moment, which is whether we have some therapeutic tools to treat patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver. Thank you very much, uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Professor Zoysom and Professor Jacobson and the organizing committee to invite me for, for the first time to this uh, wonderful meeting. And I actually put some slides because I wasn't sure that Vlad is going to get here. So I'm going to set up the stage by giving uh, some background of what, uh, why do we actually need to treat NAFLD and what regimen have been used and what are some of the new regimens that are coming down the pike that uh, could be exciting. Well, um, to put the con this question in the context of, the, uh, of clinical, economic, and patient-reported outcomes related to NAFLD is going to be the way I'm going to approach this. So when you're looking at the prevalence data, some of this data is quite new. Uh, they're all 2015, so I'm going to just share it for the first time with you. This is a meta-analysis that we have done to look at global prevalence of non-alcoholic fat liver disease. It has 20, the data came from 22 different countries, and uh, eight and a half million individuals were actually included in the meta-analysis. The prevalence of non-alcoholic fat liver disease globally is about 21.4%. The prevalence is lowest in Africa, at about 11%, and highest in the Middle East and uh, in, in South America. In Europe and North America, the prevalence is about 20%. Of course, the risk factors, as Vlad suggested, is all metabolic conditions, primarily visceral obesity. The second issue uh, that is important to remember is that, as you've heard, the NASH subtype of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is progressive. In fact, this is a study with follow-up of about 12 years, histologic NASH, as well as non-NASH type of NAFLD, when you look at after 12 years, it is really the NASH subtype that, 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 that uh, uh, die of liver-related mortality. In fact, the, not, the, the fatty liver with nonspecific inflammation, which we actually looked in this, in this group, did not die of liver-related mortality. Now, that may be the fact that they need longer follow-up than just 12 years. So it is important to remember that histologic NASH was also an independent, independent, predictor of liver-related mortality. So that's important in terms of endpoints that you want to choose. The second issue is that what do you see on histology that is absolutely the most important piece of, uh, of, uh, of this predictive sort of modeling? Is it ballooning? Is it hepatocyte inflammation? Or is it, uh, is it fibrosis? This is not a study that we did. Not the liver biopsies were read by um, my central pathologist, Dr. Zachary Goodman. And we had about, again, about 12 years of follow-up. And when you look at univariate analysis, all these other histologic features actually are associated with liver-related mortality. But when you run multivariate analysis, it's actually stage two or more fibrosis that's important in terms of predicting liver-related mortality. And this study was actually replicated in a larger study. Uh, came, was published actually earlier this year. And when you look here, this is a large number of, uh, of, of international sort of collaborators. And again, about 12, 12, 12 and a half years of follow-up. All biopsies were again read, read this time by Dave Kleiner, a, a central pathologist. And their multivariate analysis was stage two or more that was associated with liver-related mortality. This is why that the clinical trials of non-alcoholic CTI hepatitis have focused on these two important outcomes, resolution of NASH and also fibrosis. And I go to the FDA and the EMA, as others, you all do. This is right now their sort of uh, requirement for some of the studies if you're going to go for, uh, for approval of these drugs. So uh, HCC, you heard about HCC. This is the most recent data that came from population-based data. It was published in Hepatologies last month. This is the SEERS database, which is basically the database that all cancers are reported to the United States. Uh, we chose about... Uh, uh, about five, 6,000 patients uh, uh, that had all HCC, as well as about 17,000 controls. And when you look, there are really two important points here. First is that if you look at the causes 
of HCC in this cohort. Of course, hepatitis C is number one. But look at this. About a quarter of patients with HCC in the United States was related to, related to the diagnosis of NASH. The second important point of this study is that, if I can get this to go, okay, is that, in fact, they have worse prognosis. So one-year mortality of patients who had NAFLD-related HCC was worse. And when you run multivariate analysis, and you go back, let's go back one slide. When you run multivariate analysis, and you look at what were the independent predictors of having uh, uh, mortality, one-year mortality uh, from HCC, NASH or NAFLD was an independent predictor of short-term mortality. So that makes it actually important from HCC standpoint in terms of prognosis as well. And we can talk about why that is. The next important issue in terms of burden of this disease is economic. Somehow I can't get the slide to move. Can you move my slide? Advance the slide, please. So anyway, so I'll, I'll tell you that this is a, a, another study we did looking at the United States Medicare database uh, for about five years. And we look at about 29,000 individuals with a diagnosis of non alcoholic fatty liver disease who actually received care in the outpatient side of, 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 of care. Now, remember, Medicare is a government sponsored payer in the United States, similar to what you see in, in some of the European countries. And in that study, when you, there are two things that came out of that study. I can't get this to, to move uh, forward. There are two things about that study. One is that if you actually look, between these years, there's actually an increase in both payment as well as, as, well as charges related to the outpatient care of non alcoholic fatty liver disease. The second important thing that you can, if you actually want to take this and say, what is the payment for Medicare that, that was given to patients, uh, for patients, for the outpatient care of patients with non alcoholic fatty liver disease, was about between $500 to $600. Now, go back to the prevalence of NAFLD in the United States, and let's be very conservative and say about 18% 18, 18 of US populations have NAFLD. That is about 8, 45 million people. If you just simply multiply this and say, we can actually uh, identify all those patients and they can all at least get an outpatient care, this is about $26 billion per year. So it's quite a bit of uh, change that we have to actually put together to, to take care, care of this disease. Now, the last part of the burden is the, the quality of life burden uh, associated with non alcoholic fatty liver disease. I'm a, PRO expert, so I have to have at least a slide of this. I can tell you that when you look at the three different diseases, uh, uh, or three different cohorts of hepatitis C, fatty liver, and uh, uh, of, of healthy controls, this came from enhanced data, about 3,000 individuals who had non alcoholic fatty liver disease included here. When you see that, of course, the worst uh, quality of life was with patients with hepatitis C, followed by NAFLD, and they were both terribly more impaired than just general. Uh, uh, population uh, uh, age adjusted. So NAFLD has uh, important clinical, economic, and PRO burden. Now, let's talk about what treatment have been used to, to treat non alcoholic fatty liver disease. And let me just point out a few important issues. Well, first of all, uh, this is a very complex disease. It's not a single disease. I think, and I've said this multiple times, that NASH is not a disease. It's a phenotype you have multiple different pathways getting to the same phenotype. And this is really why it's such a heterogeneous sort of approach. And as I will show you, people have actually gone after single pathways to try to treat this disease, and they have failed. Uh, second is that there, they, they, there are significant problems with endpoints. Now, the most robust uh, sort of endpoints, the resolution of NASH, uh, it, you have to be very careful with, it, with, that, with that definition, because resolution of NASH could actually differ between one pathologist to another pathologist. So if you can see some change, it, there is inter and intra-observer variability with that, uh, with, that, uh, with that diagnosis. If you make that the primary endpoint of a study, and I'm gonna show you a study that they actually made that mistake and paid for it. Be aware of high placebo effect in, in, uh, in NASH. There was a very nice uh, study done by Rohit Lumba uh, a few years ago that showed that significant number of, of these uh, patients actually resolve just on placebo or improve on the placebo. There's small sample size, short duration, most of these studies. So there are very few, there are very few very robust studies. The most recent studies are done very well, but again, the older studies are not very robust. 
these are some of the targets that have been used uh, 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 to treat non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I'm not going to have time to, to review them all for you. But just a list here, just to remember that uh, you know, in terms of weight loss and lifestyle modification, there is some data, uh, and maybe uh, the next speaker can talk about this, that there may be some, some uh, uh, data suggesting that that would be effective if you can achieve it and maintain it. Lipid lowering agents and others I'll just uh, uh, review, but just to tell you that the rest of these uh, uh, agents that have been used here in 2015, there is no strong evidence to support their use at this moment. How about lipid, lipid lowering agents? So statins, again, as you can see, a number of different studies, uh, relatively short, short, small number uh, of patients, short duration of study. Enzymes can improve or not, uh, but there's really no robust histologic data. And in fact, the ACLD guideline, which is the American guideline, and I'm looking forward to the European guideline, suggested that statins can be safely used to treat hyperlipidemia or dyslipidemia in patients with non-alcoholic steroid hepatitis, but as a primary treatment, it cannot be used. So um, how about vitamin E? And as you know, oxidative stress is one of those uh, pathways that's involved in the pathogenesis of non-alcoholic steroid hepatitis. And from all these studies, I think the strongest one is PIVN's study, the act which compared vitamin E, 800 national unit uh, per day, to placebo and, and to, uh, to puglitazone. And in fact, uh, they probably used uh, vitamin E as a placebo. The unfortunate or fortunate situation was that that was the only uh, arm of the study that, that met their primary endpoint of the study. So at least at this point, the ACLD guidelines suggest that for non-diabetic with histologically proven NASH, they recommend uh, the use of vitamin E. For diabetics that's not, or cirrhotics, that's not, been, that's not been recommended. Now you just heard a little bit about uh, microbiome and dysbiosis. And of course, dysbiosis is, uh, you know, by definition, it means loss of some of the healthy uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, gut uh, um, uh, bacteria, and that has been implicated in the pathogenesis of both obesity as well as non-alcoholic steroid hepatitis. I'm not going to get into this. I can tell you that there are a number of studies look at different probiotics, as you can see them over here. Again, small number of patients between 10 to 30 that were actually included, and the results are all over the place. There is no, no, no uh, uh, strong evidence to support this. So at this point, the role of probiotic for NASH remains really unclear and unsettled. How about toxifilin? Two study, two double-blind uh, randomized controlled trials. And again, small number of patients, 30 and 50. And in fact, actually, it did show some improvement in some of the histologic markers, including fibrosis. But there's not a large study that I know of, maybe Vlad does, uh, that's, that's ongoing right now. But uh, those are the two that I can find. So let's just focus on some of the PPARs, uh, PPAR gamma, uh, to look at that first. Again, a number of different agents have been used, but I think the most robust study was the PIVENS trial that looked at the uh, pioglitazone uh, uh, for treatment, and that was the one that, that had the two other arms. And uh, unfortunately, pioglitazone was not able to meet the, the preset criteria, primary endpoint of the study. But when you actually look at individual pathologic features, there was some improvement with pioglitazone. So despite lack of uh, uh, high-level evidence, uh, ASLE still uh, recommends it to be considered for some patients, and I use it occasionally for patients who have diabetes and have NASH. So let's now look at some of the new agents, uh, uh, FXR and FXR agonists let's, uh, in, in their treatment in NASH. And just to let you know that, that FXR are, are the nuclear receptors uh, uh, that, that, that are expressed in a number of, of different cells in the liver, including hepatocytes and stellate cells. And once there is a binding of bile acids or an analog, it actually causes activation of a num of number of genes that have some very good in potential impact, both in terms of uh, uh, metabolic changes, but also anti-inflammatory and potentially antifibrotic changes. Well, the drug that has been used, and it's now been published, at least one of the first, uh, uh, their first study, obituchalic acid, is a semi-synthetic uh, bile acid analog that's about 100 times more potent than a kinetoxicolic acid uh, uh, in terms of uh, its impact or binding to the FXR. And it's actually been shown to, to uh, result in smaller studies in terms of uh, improvement of offense and resistance, as well as reduction of, uh, of liver inflammation, et cetera. But the study that was published uh, last year uh, in Lancet 
was this uh, Flint study, which was a study carried out by the NIDDK, and uh, that's basically the design of the study. So here, patients who had histologic NASH were actually enrolled either to, to, to placebo or an active arm um, um, of, the, of, the st of OCA that had 25 milligrams per day. And, uh, uh, and they, had, uh, to, they, had do, they had to do uh, pre-treatment uh, biopsy and post-treatment biopsy. And when they saw that there was significant improvement in the active arm, active arm had higher sort of rate of, of achieving the primary outcome. The study was terminated and the study was actually then published. When you look at the individual sort of features in this, uh, in this uh, uh, study, you see that actually OCA had some improvement in terms of inflammation, in, in terms of some of the hepatocyte ballooning. Uh, when you look at the resolution of NASH, uh, it did not really meet the uh, still significance, but there was a significantly strong, a strong uh, um, uh, trend here. Of course, there were some issues in terms of uh, lipid profile changes, and uh, after 72 weeks, there was uh, some dyslipidemia increase and, 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 uh, uh, and cholesterol, LDL, and a lowering of, of, of HDL. When these patients were treated with statin, this was actually then uh, uh, this was, uh, presented as a poster subsequent to this. Uh, the uh, abnormality in lipid, this lipidemia actually uh, resolved, and, and some patients actually had a better profile than even before. Pruritus was a little bit more common in these patients, than, but no other uh, adverse events were different than placebo. So let's put all of this together. And I think the, the best summary of, of what has been done so far in NAFLD came out of this uh, article that was published just last month. And Rohit Lumba did a systematic review, comparative effect effectiveness of, some, of four different relief really drugs. So he chose to look at over 950 patients that were enrolled in nine different clinical trials, and there were four different uh, uh, agents, vitamin E, glitazones, and uh, pentoxifilin, as well as OCA. Their primary endpoint of this meta-analysis was improvement of fibrosis, and there were some secondary endpoints. These are some of the secondary endpoints, and as you can see, when you're looking at inflammation or some of the other secondary endpoints, there was an improvement in most of these, um, of these agents. However, when you're looking at the primary endpoint of improvement of fibrosis, only pentoxifilin and OCA achieve that, uh, that, that primary endpoint. And that has really led to, to the next generation of, uh, of clinical trials, at least for OCA. So these are some of the new drugs. I'll spend about uh, five minutes on these, uh, on these drugs. Uh, and so we'll start with OCA. Uh, again, this is the large study called REGENERATE. REGENERATE is a phase three clinical trial that will start pretty quickly. And uh, uh, it's an international study that will enroll over 2,000 patients. And I think they probably have to screen a lot more. The, uh, biopsy, the criteria to entry is to have a biopsy confirmed NASH fibrosis stage two, two or three, or having stage one with at least a risk factor, a metabolic risk factor. So they randomized one to one to one to three different arms, 10 and 25 milligram in placebo, and they're actually the full study is up to five years with intram analysis that's already uh, uh, scheduled. So I suspect that that study will start enrolling uh, relatively soon, but uh, probably by the end of this year. The, uh, the primary endpoint of the study is actually so-called co-primary endpoint. And, and Vlad and I have been involved with this. This is a lot of uh, going back and forth between FDN and EMA. And the co-primary endpoint here is that, that has actually looked at 18 months is improvement of fibrosis without worsening of steatohepatitis and then improvement of steatohepatitis without, uh, or resolution of steatohepatitis without uh, worsening of fibrosis. There are a number of other secondary endpoints that are listed over here that's really looking at outcomes, long-term outcomes that the FDA was uh, certainly interested in. Now let's look at the other agent uh, uh, that is also in the family of PPAR. This is PPAR alpha and data. Uh, there is some uh, study that actually uh, uh, suggests that GF505, GFT505, uh, which, is a, which is a drug made by Genfit in France, uh, can have some improvement in, gl in glucose metabolism and uh, some of the other uh, uh, markers of steatohepatitis. This was the study that, that, uh, that was uh, 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 at least announced earlier this year, the Golden 505. Uh, the Golden 505 basically looked at patients who are non-serotic with NASH in a phase 2B study, and you can see the, the design over here. Two uh, arm had uh, the two doses of, uh, of uh, uh, 
uh, GT505 and then placebo. The important thing here is that the primary endpoint was resolution of NASH, at least one of the two, two important primary endpoint. I don't, haven't seen the full data peer reviewed. I know Vlad knows a lot about this study, so he can actually tell us a little bit more during the Q&A session. But there was an unexpected rate of, of, uh, of uh, resolution of NASH in the placebo arm, 57% improved. This is from the, actually the press release. Uh, from the company. However, they basically went back and said, well, there was a lot of, there was a lot of heterogeneity uh, uh, of, of sites, as well as uh, the currently patient, patients are not enrolled with, uh, with uh, early fibrosis or, or NAS score of three. So once they excluded those and reanalyzed the data, now, of course, now they meet the, can you forward? Now they meet the criteria uh, uh, of, uh, of improvement. Please advance the slides. Okay. All right, so um, th that was the, basically in the bottom of the slide suggesting that once you, uh, once you uh, uh, get rid of the, the patients that had uh, the NAS score of three, there is actually now significant. So the jury is still out, and I'm not sure if they're doing another larger study or phase three study on this. Uh, the two other agents I want to uh, just touch upon, this is the CCR2, CCR5 um, um, antagonists. They, they really are uh, antifibrotic agents, and Tobira is the one that's actually ongoing, uh, 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 have uh, ongoing study that, uh, that is not enrolling, I don't think, anymore, but uh, uh, the patients are in this uh, protocol for two years. Uh, two-arm study, and uh, the uh, endpoint is really improvement of NAS score by at least two, without, uh, with at least one improvement in, in one of the, uh, the components of NAS score without worsening of the fibrosis, and a number of, of non-invasive uh, biomarkers. The uh, next to the last is Haramacol, which is a synthetic molecule of conjugated bile acid and saturated fatty acid. It improves hepatic fat. And the only study that's, that's ongoing, the only study that's been done, showed some improvement of hepatic fat in patients that received the two doses. So this is the study that's ongoing, supported by Tobira. And uh, actually, it's not Tobira, it's, it's, it's Galmet, Galmet. And as you can see, it's called the ARREST study. And, uh, uh, and the study is ongoing, and hopefully we'll have some data soon. Uh, just uh, uh, a couple of minutes on the um, LOX2 um, uh, antibody. Uh, or sim, uh, simtuzumab. This is the drug by Gilead. And just to remind you that LOX is Im involved and uh, it is uh, one of the imp in, 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 in important in the, in the step of, of uh, collagen binding. And as you can see, this is a serious red with collagen, and this is LOX2 sort of uh, staining, so it goes where fibrosis is. In fact, in hepatitis B patients with more advanced fibrosis, there is an increase level of LOX2. So the humanized uh, monoclonal antibody uh, uh, against LOX2 is what symptomzumab uh, is and is now being actually uh, used in the clinical trial, the phase 2B clinical trial that, that has been ongoing. I'll show you the design of this. These, there are actually two studies. One is for cirrhotics, and as you can see, these studies are fully enrolled. So it can go on to up to, I think, up to 90 six uh, weeks for the end of the study, and then five years with a, with a, with a follow-up. The primary outcome of the study is to measure portal pressure. The second piece of this is bridging fibrosis, patients with NASH and bridging fibrosis, and it's also enrolled. And here, basically, the, the outcome is, uh, is histologic uh, improvement, and, and in fact, they're doing fibrosis morphometry to quantify fibrosis in, in uh, collagen in these patients. And the, the latest kit in the block is uh, from Gilead is uh, GS4997, uh, which is a small molecule, and it's a selective inhibitor of ASC1. Uh, now, ASC1 is activated by hyperglycemia uh, as well as oxidative stress. Both of these are involved in the pathogenesis of non-alcoholic hepatitis, and by inhibiting ASC1, there is actually a suggestion that you can actually improve metabolic uh, abnormality as well as a potential uh, inflammatory and, and, and fibrotic activities. So Gilead has actually combined this in this uh, latest study that actually is now enrolling. In fact, our site is one of the sites that has enrolled, and they are, they are combining this to, to uh, simtuzumab. Uh, this is the lower dose, sub-Q dose of simtuzumab every two weeks uh, um, on a weekly basis, plus uh, 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 
plus uh, uh, this, uh, this drug. They ask one inhibitor uh, for 24 weeks, and obviously the endpoints are primarily safety endpoints more than, more than anything else. So to summarize, uh, I, can, I showed you and Vlad showed you that NAFLD is very common, and, but uh, I didn't show you that in the United States, at least, it is a very under-recognized uh, disease. Probably about 10% of patients really get any form of treatment, uh, and probably even less than that. NASH patients have higher uh, rate of liver rate mortality. The nonspecific inflammation, fatty liver, may have some progressiveness, but we need a lot, lot longer uh, uh, follow-up to show any kind of mortality outcome. Stage two or greater, stage two or greater fibrosis on the biopsy is becoming predictive of liver-related mortality, and fibrosis become an important endpoint and, uh, for a treatment of NASH. There are a number of sort of uh, ongoing uh, uh, or, or uh, old regimens that have been used, I think, from all of those. Uh, lifestyle modification is probably uh, recommended by everyone, except it may not work because nobody is able to actually maintain it. Vitamin E, at least in the United States, is recommended, but not, a, not the other ones. And by the way, I didn't touch on this, but bariatric surgery certainly can work for patients who have NASH and are morbidly obese. And there are a number of clinical trials that are ongoing, and hopefully we'll see something better in non-alcoholic state hepatitis in five years. Uh, we'll hopefully come back and show you hundreds of well-designed studies as we see in hepatitis C and patients with NASH as well. That's been my talk. Thank you very much.